Shalom. Today we're going to investigate the scripture in Jeremiah 31, which is sometimes translated by some to be new covenant and sometimes translated as renewed covenant. We're going to look at this both from a linguistic point of view and a conceptual point of view. Here is the scripture, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says Jehovah, but this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says Jehovah, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, No Yehovah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says Yehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The words that are translated there are Brit Chadasha. Brit is a feminine noun, that means covenant. Chadasha is an adjective that means new. They're both feminine singular. So if we go to the Strong's and we look up this word chadash as an adjective, it's always translated as new. Exodus 1.8 Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So nobody's going to think that that was a renewed king. It was a new king. Judges 16.11 And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes, that were never occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Samson lying to his girlfriend. They're not renewed ropes, they're new ropes. So the problem comes when we actually look at this root, chadash, as a verb, and the King James consistently translates it to be renewed or repair. So we have to understand some things about Hebrew grammar. How do we get from here to there? These slides are all from the Blue Letter Bible, you can look them up yourself, and this is the Jacenius entry under the verb which has the root chadash. First we see that it's unused in the kal, and it means to be new. However, we see in the pl it means to renew, and in the hitpa'el it means to renew oneself. So what are these fancy terms? These terms in Hebrew are called binyanim, And there is not a good translation for this word because the concept, this grammatical concept, occurs only in Hebrew and maybe Aramaic, I think somebody told me. I don't know Aramaic. So in Hebrew, there are these seven binyanim. Three are active, three are passive, and one of them is reflexive. And the verb root, chadash, does not appear in the simplest form. It appears in the two forms here that I've highlighted the pl and the hitpa'el. To give you a sample of what exactly the binyan is, and I refer to it as a strength of the verb, all nobody else does. There are a lot of different terms for it. But if we have this first verb, lamid mem dalid, if it is in the pa'al, if it's in the simplest form, it means to learn. But if it's in the PL, it's a more intensive form. It means to teach. Clearly, conceptually, learning and teaching are related. And in Hebrew, the words are related. Here is another root, kaf, tav, bet, katav. Very simple word. You might know it in the pa'al. In the simple form, it means to write. In the he feel, which we're not covering here, but just to give you a sense of it, it means to cause to write. In other words, to dictate. If I dictate a letter, I cause the secretary to write the letter. Hit pa'el, it's a reflexive. That means it goes back and forth between you and me. In other words, we're corresponding. We're each writing to each other. So this gives you a small taste of what the concept of binyan is. By prefixes, suffixes, infixes, and also all the vowels indicate in the verb, when you read the verb, what binyan, what is the strength of that verb? Is it active? Is it passive? Is it reflexive? I have a whole overview of the verb system in Hebrew, and I'll put a link to that if you're interested to get a little more into it. So now looking at the places where this root is actually translated as renew, 
There's only a handful of them, as you saw, but we'll look at some of them. 1 Samuel 11:14. Then said Samuel to the people, Come, and let us go to Gilgal, and renew the kingdom there. It's the same root, chadash, but it is in the PL form. It's a verb PL form. Second Chronicles 24, 4. And it came to pass after this that Joash was reminded to repair the house of Jehovah. He's going to renew it. It's in the PL. Job 10, 17. You renew your witnesses against me and increase your indignation upon me. Changes and war are against me. Again in the PL. Psalm 103, 5. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. In this place, this is the Hitpael. Remember, in the original Jeremiah scripture, the root is used as an adjective. It's not used as a verb. Here are the cases of it being used in a verb, but not the simplest form to make something new, in more complex form to mean renewed. Now, one of the arguments that people make for the root and translation in Jeremiah 31 to be renewed is the argument about the moon. So you can see the same root comes to mean chodesh, which means month. And it comes from the idea that the moon is new. Genesis 7:11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. 1 Samuel 20. Five. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go, that I might hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. So the argument goes that at the new moon, there is not a new rock in the sky. It's not new. It's renewed. The light, maybe, is renewed. We need to remember that Hebrew is a language of function, not form. The function of the light being renewed in the moon is to show us the month. It's not to tell us that there's something new about the moon. I do not believe that there's a new rock in the sky. It's the way God set it up. And the moon is there, what? For times and seasons. So when we see the light renewed, we know that the month is renewed. At the end of March, we're not going to say, oh, the month is renewed and we're going to have another March. No, we have a new month. We begin counting from the beginning. So the concept is still an idea of something new. It's a new month. It's a new count. Now, a covenant is a contract. There are stipulations laid out about about what each party will do. There was a mutual promise, and then usually there's some ceremony to put it into effect. The covenant itself is the promise. It's not the stipulations of the contract. So if we can make an example, we're best friends, and we buy land next to each other, and we find a great contractor, and we're going to build the same house side by side. We're both going to have the same house. So in the contract, everything of the stipulations of the contract is the same. But it's not a renewed covenant if you sign yours first and I sign mine second. It's a new covenant. And why is that? That's because the people are new. The stipulations of the contract do not make the covenant. The agreement is the covenant. So going back in history, biblical history, we see these are some covenants. Genesis 6, 18. But with you will I establish my covenant, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your son's wives with you. God makes an agreement with Noah, and then he lays out some things that will happen as a result of their agreement. Genesis 9, 11, and 12, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Talking about the rainbow. The rainbow is not the covenant. It's a sign of the covenant. The covenant is the agreement. Also with Noah, every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. 
and surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. This is the agreement. And then there are the stipulations. I'm not going to destroy the earth again. You can eat these foods. Do not murder anybody. These are stipulations of the covenant. They are stipulations of other covenants as well, but the stipulations do not define the covenant. The agreement between them is what defines the covenant. Speaking of Abraham, Genesis 15, 18. In the same day, Jehovah made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. In Genesis 17, And I will make a covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto you, and to your seed after you. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man-child in your generations, he that is born in your house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of your seed, he that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. God is setting up a generational agreement. Clearly, the baby at eight days old cannot consent to the covenant. He can't agree. But as a child grows and bears the token, the mark of the agreement, hopefully he will meditate on that. He will learn about it. And he will continue in his mind and purpose in his mind to keep the covenant with God as well. Having a token of the covenant, whether in the sky or in your flesh, does not mean that you are in the covenant. You have to decide to join the covenant, to be in the agreement. At Sinai, Exodus 19.5 Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus 24 And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that Jehovah has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Jehovah has made with you concerning all these words. This is putting the covenant into effect. This is the ritual we talked about earlier that puts the agreement into effect. But first, the people have to agree. In every single case, before any stipulations, any laws, any Torah is given, people must be in covenant with God first. God doesn't give the rules and then say, okay, do these things and then we'll be in covenant. First, they make an agreement to be in covenant, to be in that relationship, and then the stipulations, the Torah, the law comes. Exodus 31, 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Now we will look at the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament. Matthew 26, 26 through 28. Yeshua took bread, blessed the Lord, and broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the King James does use the word testament. However, as you can see, the word is viathiki, and it is translated both as covenant and testament. So I'm not changing the words of, of the scripture. He clearly said this is a new covenant. Now, if we look at the word in Greek for new, it is kainos. And it means recently made, fresh, recent, unused, unworn, 
A new kind, precedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. It is clearly something brand new. There is also renewal in the New Testament, for example, Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hebrews 6, 3. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shame. Now we see that the word for renewed, in the New Testament, in the Greek, is based on the kainos, the new, but it has a prefix, ana. So it doesn't mean the same thing. The prefix alters the meaning of the word and brings it to mean renewed. If you're wondering if a prefix can change something like that, uh, I'll give you this example. In English, we have pro and we have con. I want you to think about these two words progress, and congress. What is the reason for the new covenant? Hebrews 8, 6-8. But now has he, that is Yeshua, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the day is come, says the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he proceeds to quote the Jeremiah 31 scripture. Now put the word covenant there in italics. It does not appear in the text. An editor of the text, a translator, has added this word. There was a problem with the agreement. But the problem was not the stipulations of the agreement, as is often taught. It says he found fault with them. The problem with the covenant was the people. Another relevant scripture we talk about when we talk about the new covenant, Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So there's some more use of new as an adjective here. Lev chadash, a new heart. Ruach chadasha, ruach is feminine. So we see the feminine ending. A new spirit. They're not renewed, they are brand new. In Greek, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Messiah, he is a new, kainos creature. Remember, it means brand new, novel. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, kainos. You are a new creature in Messiah because you have a new heart and a new spirit. They're not renewed. Now, back in the Jeremiah 31, we, we have this sentence. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says Jehovah. So the word here for husband is ba'ali. It's actually a verb that means to be a husband. But we have this word ba'al. And it is still used somewhat even in modern Israel when women speak about their husbands. But this Baal is the same Baal that you know from the false god Baal. It just means Lord. Again, in Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband, Baal. Yehovah of hosts is his name, and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth, he shall be called. But there is a change coming, as prophesied in Hosea 2. And it shall be at that day, says Jehovah, that you shall call me Ishi and shall call me no more Baali. Our relationship with our husband is going from Baal, Lord, to Ish. In the beginning, there was a man, Ish, and a woman, Isha. The two words are related. One is the masculine, one is the feminine. The two of them are different, but they are equal in their functions. They each function in their own function. In that sense, they are equal. And that change comes when we are the new creation. There is a change in the nature of the relationship. 
Therefore, there is a change in the nature of the covenant. We'll address this a little bit more in one minute. However, the statutes and precepts, the stipulations, are not what defines the covenant. The covenant is the agreement. Now, looking at some Old Testament rules of marriage, we see this. Deuteronomy 24. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and gives it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Jehovah, and you shall not cause the land to sin, which Jehovah your God gives you for an inheritance. Now Paul extends this to the believer in Romans 7. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. In our previous life, whatever higher power we may have served, we were bound by some law to that. When we die, then we are free from that. It is about the covenant. It's about the agreement, not the stipulations. So let me give you the example. Suppose you get married and you have a ketubah which has lovely scriptures on it saying how you are going to treat your spouse, how you are going to treat one another. And you abide by these stipulations of the covenant. You make an agreement and you have stipulations to your covenant, to your agreement. And then by some unforeseen and tragic circumstance, you lose your spouse. So after a while, you decide, you meet the right person, you're going to remarry. And you both look at your old ketubah and say, wow, this has all these great scriptures on it. We want to have the same kind of relationship through the Lord as is described by these scriptures on this ketubah. Maybe we'll use the same scripture. We'll have the same stipulation. When you marry your new spouse, is that a renewed covenant? Not at all. It is a new covenant. The covenant is new because the people are new. The covenant spoken of by Jeremiah and by Yeshua at his last supper, that is a new agreement. The stipulations might be the same. We are still going to eat a certain way. We are going to celebrate certain holidays. We are going to treat one another after a certain fashion. We are going to love God with all our heart, soul, and might. We are going to love our neighbor as ourselves. All those things will be the same stipulations, but it is a new agreement because you are a new person.